Hello and welcome to this episode of Up Your Vibe with Paula Kallick. And today I want to talk a little bit about anxieties of sending your child to primary school. I've done it three times with my three boys and I think on each time I worried about oh, how are they going to get on at school? Are they going to get on with the other children? Are they going to be anxious about leaving me? Are they going to get picked on at school? And I must admit, from time to time, I have had issues with my children at school. Very tiny ones, but my kids were quite strong and resilient and were able to ride the waves along it. Uh, the last child was a little bit difficult and I had to have some interventions with the school. And how grateful would I have been if I could have had some other form of help? And this is where Vicky Tongman comes in because she has written a brilliant book called Daphne and the Smiley Shells. And this book is aimed at primary school children to help them with some of the issues that I've just mentioned. So welcome, Vicky. Hello. And how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. And thank you so much, because I know that this episode is going to be of great interest to many parents who feel, understandably, anxious about sending their children to school. So your book is designed for primary um, age children. Can you tell me a little bit about the book and why it came around? Yes, um, the book is, called, as you said, called Daphne and the Smiley Shells. And it's a story about um, a young dolphin who is fairly early on in school and she is feeling quite sad, lacking in confidence and anxious. And the reason that I chose to, wrote it, to write it was because I wanted to be able to pass on my knowledge about supporting children to parents. And I knew that their fears, they had fears around how they, children would get on at school and how they would get on in life and whether they'd reach their potential. And I knew I had the tools that I could share with them. Um, that's why I wanted to put it in a really simple children's story that both the parents and the children could share together and do an activity together at the same time. So is it something that you experienced yourself as a child or as your own child experienced these issues that we talked about earlier at school? I, that, that make yeah, I think when I, I didn't realise when I wrote the book, but looking back, yes, I was um, not that confident at school. And I did have times when I felt like I couldn't really get things right. And I was quite a fearful um, child at times probably due to some overprotective carers that I was with at the time. So, um, yeah, I, I understand now why I did this, but at the same time I was working with parents in another capacity and I just really wanted their, to, to stop them or their children from suffering some of, the, uh, some of the confidence issues I had in later life due to the fact that I'd not been programmed to think well of myself when I was younger. So it really is like a two-pronged approach here. It's, it's not just about the child's feeling, but it's also about training the parent uh, that they can support their children through these times. Absolutely. My whole goal is that parents learn how important it is to value themselves um, and to think well of themselves because for so long, you know, we tend to think, oh, I, I didn't get the washing done today or I didn't get the washing up done. And we forget all the things we did do. And um, I also want them to be able to train their children to, to form a habit of thinking well of themselves at a young age, because I know what a difference it will make to them in the rest of life. Now, we know that children are... Um, very programmable. They're, they're like sponges. They, they, they absorb everything in their life up to the age of seven, eight. And so whatever beliefs uh, and whatever habits we can, positive habits, we can get into them at a young age, the more likely they are to have those habits for the rest of their life. Even if they forget them during uh, teenagehood later on, they'll yes. still have that habit of 
um, you know, beginning to, to think well of themselves again. And it's really important to distinguish the fact that as the parent, you are the child's teacher and they will pick up everything from you. If you're Absolutely. in a good mood, if you're in a bad mood, if you're angry, if they witness domestic violence, if they get hit themselves, all these things are buried inside that unconscious mind and they use these as their resources to go along in their everyday lives. So it's really, really important that we have good habits ourselves Yes. But, and then your children are more likely to have good habits themselves. So when you talk about good habits, what do you believe good habits are? So in, in terms of this book, the good habits are choosing to think well of ourselves. So in the book, um, Daphne learns that she can put a shell in a jar and say something that she's happy about. So one of the first habits is noticing what we can be happy about whatever else is going on in life so um, I know there was a, a writer who um, when he was actually homeless he chose to feel grateful and happy about um, anything he could in his life he found a stub of pencil and he chose to say thank you so much for this stub of pencil you know this man had nothing but he chose to say thank you for this I'm so grateful and eventually built up into a very, uh, very different life. So gratitude, saying that you're happy, the, the words I am are so powerful. And whatever we say after them, as an NLP coach, I know that we're actually building neural pathways in our brain that will, you know, create that thought again and again. So if we're always thinking, I'm so fed up with this, or, oh, nothing ever goes right then we're just going to notice more and more of what doesn't go right. But if we start turning our mind around and thinking, what is going well? What can I be grateful for? What is good about me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I might not look like a model. You know, I might, not, uh, I might not be the best athlete, but I was kind to my friend this morning. Yes. And, you know, every child at the moment is expected to be amazing at so many things. And if they can just learn to come back to basics and to think about who they are and what special things they have about them, then all of those other demands that they have out there at school or after school clubs or whatever, they won't matter so much because they'll be building a pillar of confidence for themselves. It's really, really, um, for me, um, I can already feel the things bubbling up in myself as you're talking about this because you are relying on your mum or your dad or your carers to say to you, Paula, you were really good at this today, or yeah. Paula, you are really good at that. Yeah. And my experience is that, oh, you're not worth anything. You did so badly at school today. Your results weren't this good, or it wasn't positive. No. So yeah. If if you are ingraining this into your child, how can the child itself learn to be grateful and positive? Well, there was two things there. I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I've had parents say to me, but I always tell my child they, they're very good at what they're doing. I always compliment my child. And I say to them, yes, but what happens when you're not there? Or what happens when you're in a bad mood? Or when their teacher doesn't notice that they've done something well or when they get older their boss is so busy they don't notice how hard they've worked at something they won't have the resources within themselves to say well do you know what okay they were tired or they didn't notice but i did it well um so that that's a really good point and and thank you for bringing that one up and that's that's what that's what the book's about really and could you just remind me of your second of the thing, the question you just asked me? Please? It's if the child has been brought up this way and it's not been praised all its life, mm. it doesn't yeah. know how to be grateful because it can't recognise what it's good at, what the boy or the girl is yeah. good at. Yeah, okay. So for me, it's around the parent becoming aware, a mum or dad or grandparent sitting with the child, having a jar and some buttons or some shells or something and to begin with they may need to um, guide the child so to start with they might they might even say something like do you know what while you're at school today I was really kind 
to my neighbour. Um, she was struggling with some bags. Uh, she's an old lady. And so I took the bags in for her. Do you think that was kind of me? And the, the, the child can then recognise what that means. And they, maybe they could say, well, where do you think you were kind today? Or what do you think you did that was helpful today? So, um, so this is what you call emotional piggy banking. Yes, because as, I, love, I love that term. I really as, do. <laughs> as, as, as you sort of put a shell or a button or whatever people want to put in a jar and the child says, I'm so happy that I was kind to my friend today. Mm. You've got the I am, which is the, uh, the new linguistic programming. They're yeah. so happy so that it's going to help to build their positive thoughts about themselves and then they're affirming something that is good about themselves mm. now the sneaky trick that i have for parents is that um there's a thing called positive reinforcement so the more you notice something that a child has done the more they are going to do it so yeah. if you're for, for for instance if you were forever saying um i don't make that noise don't make that noise chances are they're going to carry on doing it if they're not getting attention in any other way Mm -hmm. But if you say to them, maybe when you put the shell in the jar, you might like to say, I'm so happy that I put my shoes or I remembered to put my shoes by the door today. Then the child gets a message, A, that you've noticed that they've done what you asked and put their shoes by the door. But B, it's reinforcing that that's a good, acceptable thing to do. Plus, they're telling themselves that they're the sort of person that puts their shoes by the door. Hmm. So you are programming them both as a parent, but also getting them to program themselves. that They're the kind of person that's happy to put their shoes by the door. Yeah. So okay. you mentioned that for this piggy banking that you could use a glass jar. Uh, but I like the idea of maybe the parent and the child sitting down together and decorating a box. Yes, that's another lovely idea. It's whatever works for the individual, really. No, because that's um, a joint a joint adventure and doing it yes. together. It's sort of more yeah. bonding for them to do that. And I find that when people work on a job together, it, it just creates that little bit more commitment to it and motivation to use it. Yeah. Um, the jar is also decoratable in the book actually Daphne paints on on the jar to decorate it or you can put stickers or whatever and a box is certainly a, a, another lovely way to do it the thing with a jar is that you can see the shells or the items building up yes slowly so yeah. you can there's something I don't know what it is there's something about seeing these items building up within the jar so that you get this sense of there being more and more goodness in it Exactly, because you, you're tapping into the perception of the vision, the visual. Yeah. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And there's absolutely no reason why um, um, a parent, mum or dad, grandparent, couldn't make their own jar alongside the child and they could have one each because it would re it, we, we talked about how um, children copy their mm -hmm. parents. So they might feel less silly or awkward if they actually saw their their parent doing it as well yeah. and that ha has the added advantage that the parent then begins to build their own uh, pillar of confidence and emotional piggy bank but I'm ha more than happy for people to use whatever material they want to <laughs> as long as they do it and you, and you, you actually um, talked about something there that is really important and that's the the parent how we learn from our parents and when I was bringing my own children up, I would often catch myself sounding exactly like my mother. And I despised myself for it. And I thought, how can that be? But it's not conscious. No, that's absolutely right. Because we've absorbed it as children. And it, it just, in certain situations, we're triggered to sound just like them and uh, or to, to do what they did. Mm -hmm. and, and so obviously this this particular book is is around um programming children to think and to act positively for themselves and the more independently they can think for themselves um the more the less likely they are to copy what any negative things that parents are doing because they will 
um, have a higher sense of their own selves and what is acceptable for them. Yeah. So if, so if, for instance, because I did work with some, some groups of people who um, were recovering from violent relationships, <coughs> they, it is likely that they were in a violent relationship because they didn't have enough confidence and self-esteem to understand what was appropriate for them. But it, when we get a sense of our own, own positive selves, uh, when we begin to learn what's acceptable for us, either we will come across some behavior and the first or second time round go, yep, yeah, no, this isn't for me, as, as Daphne does, as she becomes more confident. Um, and at the same time, if we have that higher sense of self-esteem and higher energy, we're less likely to attract uh, ne negative circumstances uh, for us so, so it's so really on. important mm. that the parent then becomes the coach so yes. what suggestions can you give to the audience listening how they can work towards being a coach to develop their children to become emotionally resilient so the best way is to listen to the child and to guide them gently I would say have a sense of who the outcome you would like from this. So a lot of parents have told me that they are concerned about their children not reaching their potential or, um, you know, ending up with the wrong partner or the wrong friends or being bullied at school. So what's the outcome you want for your child? And I'm guessing that outcome is for them to feel confident in themselves, whatever the circumstances and whatever they're told by other people and to have a sense of the gifts that they have to offer the world now the best way that they can do that is to have someone like yourself to give them feedback about things they might not notice about themselves you know they, they won't they won't be able to see their smile they won't be able to um unless they're looking in the mirror of course but uh, they won't generally notice their own behavior so it will take um, some reflection from the parent to begin with mm -hmm. to, to, to notice and tell them how they have been uh, helping their little sister with something or how, how clever it was that they solved that problem. Yes. Now, now the other way of another way of coaching is to actually talk through a problem that you're dealing with yourself. So potentially you could even make up something, but, Potentially, you could say, oh, I'm having this issue with a friend at work. Um, she's not sharing her biscuits when she comes to work or something like that. Do you think that's kind or not? And what do you think I could do about it? Now, it doesn't have to be that you have a friend at work who doesn't share her biscuits. But if you've noticed something in your child that you feel could do with a little bit of tweaking, it's not nice to go, you don't do this. That's a sort of accusatory thing. But if we can bring a subject and a story into conversation, then it's a simple and easy way of sharing some wisdom and encouraging the child to think about how they are having an effect on other people or, or even on themselves. That is really a really nice way of dealing with that issue as well without making an issue out of it. Mm yeah it's really so, good Vicky I love that idea thank you um and then that's you know fits in with the shell box or jar um or again whatever you choose to do you could be you could choose to just all while you're sitting around having dinner you could choose to say one thing you're grateful for today mm. uh, or happy about you know if, if that feels more right or if the children are a little bit older and perhaps they're not sure about playing with shells and things Yes. Or, you know, when you're sitting in the car, actually having a little think about what um, you and the child or children would like to happen during the day before you go to school and work would be a really good trick to, to get them to think about, you know, what, uh, what's your ideal day is too big a question, but what good thing would you like to happen today? Or, mm -hmm. or more importantly, how would you like to feel today? Because we can't control other people. We can't control whether our best friend is in a good mood or wants to play with us today or whatever. But we can control about how we'd like to feel today. And yeah. if we go into school or into work with the intention to have 
a certain feeling um, like happy um, or kind or something like that then it can help us to focus on who and how we're going to be during the day. I'm really glad that you've brought to the attention of the audience of only focusing on today because I noticed that the three problems that you found that parents have, if you'd like to repeat them again, it was something to do with their children's potential. Yeah, um, reach, reaching their potential, ending up with a, um, a, the, wrong, the wrong, partner. wrong partner or the wrong job, um, or being bullied at school. And all of those are fear based and they're also in the future. Yes. And while you're reflecting on things like that, that is what you're actually going to attract. Absolutely. So it's it's you know it's really important to be mindful about what you're thinking, the language that you're using, and to stay present. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Focus on the here and now. What do you want your child to achieve today? Mm. Yeah, and also what have you achieved today? But I don't like the word achievement necessarily mm. because I think that fits too much into grades at school and things like that. So maybe it's how do you want your child to be or feel today? This is so important, the language that we use with our children yeah and, and also for ourselves as parents yeah. yeah because although we're talking predominantly about children if we are not feeling that we are worthy and we don't deserve one thing or another that is still going to project outwards and affect everybody around us that's absolutely right and of course f from from two points of view one being that if we don't feel worthy, then we're less likely to set boundaries and to parent effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, <clears throat> we, we all want the best for our families and our children. And if our confidence is low or we don't feel that we deserve, then how are we going to attract the kind of experiences that we want for our families? So, you know, there's, there's just two reasons to, to work on our own self-esteem and recognize our own value as well. And as, as mums especially, we do tend to spend a lot of time putting ourselves down um, and thinking, am I, go am I doing this right? Am I, are they going to grow up okay? You know, have I given them the right food? Have I given them the right toys? And actually all they need is our attention, not all day, but our attention for a short while and love. And that's yeah. it. And the rest of the world can give them other, other things. As a parent of three boys, and there's a big gap between my two older boys and my youngest son, um, I can see that while I was a young mother, I really used skills that my mum taught me and brought my children up with that model. And it might not have been the best I possibly mm could have been because I didn't have the potential inside of me to be anything more than that 18 year old girl that gave birth to that little baby yeah and the 19 year old that gave birth to the little baby and they're all boys and I have noticed that in that 16 year child uh, gap between my children I was a different mother to my younger child because I'd learned more skills by that time. I was 34 when I had my child. And I'm not saying to everybody, you shouldn't be having children at 18 or 19. But I really was a better mother at 34 than I was at 18. Yes. Because of my experience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it. We don't realise we think we're grown up at that age. And to some extent we are. But there is still so much to learn and okay, as long as we keep our children safe and fed and housed, that's the basics. And as long as we want to be a good parent, then we care. That is the most important thing. Okay. And just the fact that we want to be a good parent makes us a good parent. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it can also mean that we're open to support and advice from other people as well. Because even 
you know, at my mature age, I'm still learning. You know, we, we all have, we all have experiences, life moves on. Um, and nobody expects a parent to be perfect because, hey, it's a 24 seven job and nobody would try and employ somebody 24 seven. There would be all sorts of laws, etc. Um, not just that, but even when we're not with our children, we're still thinking about them and worrying about them and planning for them. Um, and at the same time, maybe trying to do a job as well, maybe even two or three jobs to try and support the family. It is and, really difficult to be a parent these days. Yeah. And children don't come with a manual. And even if they did, it's not one size fits all because what's good for one child may not be good for the other child. And I can guarantee that when your child grows up and becomes an adult, they are going to blame you for something that's gone wrong in their life. Mm. Even if you've been the best parent you possibly can be. And you have to prepare for that because it's hurtful. But you can only do the best you can do for your child by gaining the resources to coach them, to be that good parent and do the absolute best you can for them. Regardless of how much time you can spend with your children, that time must be quality time you must turn off the media you must switch off the phone tune into your children and not into the media that's that's right yeah and as long as they can have um maybe 15 minutes of your undivided attention per day that is a really good start you know we're not we're, we're not saying that anyone's got to be perfect and we know there are many demands on parents um, and all I can say is the more that you can look at building your own inner strength through perhaps this, this coaching system that I've put together or whatever works for you, walking by the beach, you know, having a five minute meditation, doing some deep breathing, going into another room and punching a cushion rather, rather than let rip at the children. Yes. Um, and then the good calm. habits that you've already yeah. talked about, isn't it? Yeah, all of that. As and when, um, and nobody's perfect. We're all human, and there will be times when you can't be the perfect parent. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes, you know, uh, losing uh, losing your rag, as it were, if you don't do it very often, can actually make the children sit up and listen. Yeah. But if <clears throat> if you lose your rag every day, eventually they become deaf to it. So yeah. it's really powerful to stay calm as much as possible and then when you really need to kind of almost make a big deal of something before it becomes a big deal I think this is a, a tip that I've heard from teachers when they can see something escalating they pretend they're cross before they get cross so they're still in control and so that they don't actually end up you know saying things they might regret later or, or, or you know losing their temper um, and then if they can get away for a few moments, make sure they're calm and then come back, then they may find that they see the situation in a slightly different light, or at least they're more able to advise the child around the problem in a way that they and their child will be proud of when they get older. With emotional intelligence, we talk about the six second rule that instead of letting it all bleh out <laughs> when you're in that state, just give yourself six seconds, count to six seconds, take a breath in. If you're after, like you said, walk away and then come back after six seconds and then make a more informed choice of words that you wish to use. Yes. And this yeah. is with your partner as well. This is not just with children. This, this you can use at work. Give yourself six seconds, take a breath in, and then do what you need to do, but do it in a more um, informed way. Yeah, that's one reason, why, one reason why I like writing, because I can think about what I'm going to write before I, um, before I send it out. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's quite a good way of communication for me. Mm. I can also reread it. But of course, you can't do that with children. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't do that with children. But then again, if you've done something that you believe has been harmful to the child, you shouted at them and 
both my older children will tell you I shouted at them and one was specifically um, told me as he grew older mum do you realize how much I hated you shouting at me uh, and yeah. I couldn't take it back, but I could apologise for it and say, look, I really didn't realise. I just did the best I could with the skills that I was taught. And my parents shouted at me, my mum shouted at me, and that's the way I thought it was. And I didn't shout all the time, but I did shout. So if you do something that you think has destroyed that child, and I know I can look back and say to my child now, I can see what I did, and I'm sorry, he hates raised voices and I cause that I'm mm. responsible and that makes me feel terrible so if it had told me earlier I could have done something about it but you didn't mm. but you as a parent now that you've heard this and you know how shouting can damage a child even for the rest of his or her life you can stop now and apologize and say look I'm going to do my best not to shout. I am going to find another way of communicating with you rather than snapping at you, rather than losing my temper. I'm going to use that six second rule and I'm going to stand back and say, how can I do this differently? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And as an, as an NLP coach, I quite often end up taking adults back in time to heal a frightening or un fortunate situation that they experienced as a child and so I know it's a big responsibility to think of but you know there are moments that are quite um, that they, they could end up repeating themselves several times over your child's lifetime because of something they've ex experienced um, back in the day um, just as a tiny example and not about parenting but I was once stuck as a tiny child I was once stuck in a field of nettles um we were going to see a horse as a school trip and nobody had noticed because i was the youngest smallest child in the group that i was i couldn't move and i remember only a year ago saying to um a, a coach of mine something around i feel like whichever way i move i get hurt mm -hmm. and i went i kind of tapped into the situation and i went back in time and i remembered that's it that particular day which i had completely forgotten about and what i did because i love using metaphor which is again why i've got my book yes in my mind i got hold of um a fire thrower flamethrower as a child and i took that flamethrower and i switched it on and i stood and i turned around until all the nettles were burnt and wilted around me wow. and then i walked out of that situation and I haven't had that feeling since. Obviously, I came back to the present and I haven't had that feeling since. And visualisation is so important. And, yeah. you know, even if you don't live by the sea, I mean, you and I are quite fortunate. The sea's just a short distance away from us. But for somebody who can't make it to the seaside at the weekend, if that's something that makes them really happy, they can do that visual beach visualisation with the children. Absolutely. And there are so many things on YouTube these days or, or um, sounds, you know, that you can download and uh, just imagine that you're on the beach. Um, and if that's what makes them happy, or it could be the forest or going up a mountain or whatever feels good for them. And um, stepping it up a little bit, you know, if it's to do with confidence, you could go through a self visualization of the child doing something in a confident way absolutely yes yeah. so again you know part of the story of Daphne and the smiley shells is at the end of the story because she's been imagining herself getting better and better at surfing she actually her body has actually learned to surf her mind has helped her body to learn to surf and so she's able to surf more easily than she had at the beginning and mm -hmm. that could could be the same as being able to run more quickly, being able to tie your shoelaces, um, being able to speak up and at the front of the class, whatever it is. 
Yeah, um, so, so you could actually future pace with the child so they yeah. could see themselves speaking in front of the classroom and doing it, delivering that speech, whatever they're going to say in a confident way. But obviously you need to make it specific for a six-year-old child. You couldn't oh, yeah. talk adult talk to them. It's got to be in a way that the child can understand. Yeah, so you could say, imagine that you're standing at the front of the classroom um, and imagine how you would like it to be. So what are your friends doing? And if they say, oh, they're fidgeting and laughing at me, say, well, let's imagine them sitting still and smiling and looking up at you. Um, and then you can ask them about what they're feeling um, and help them to imagine feeling happy and confident. Mm -hmm. or strong or tall or whatever works well for them um, so it's seeing hearing and feeling so the last one could be what are you hearing and it could be silence or it could be um, my friends laughing at my joke or it could be my teacher telling me how well I've done mm -hmm. you know something along those lines but it's almost like you could you can get the child to tell the story for themselves that is more powerful than you actually putting in the words for them as well yes Much yeah more powerful yeah i mean it's it's obviously sometimes depending on the child's age they might not know what they need to feel or they might know, not know what that feeling is like but even simple things like um if sometimes children or adults give other people more power than themselves so they might almost see the other person as being bigger than them so sometimes it's useful for the child to grow a little bit like Alice in Wonderland maybe and yeah. for everything else to actually be made smaller and, and not um, to forget this technique can also be used by mums and dads too because they also may be lacking in something that they want to improve themselves, not lacking in something, but they yeah. want to improve themselves. So they too can, especially when it comes to the children, if they want to be a better parent, they want to be able to interact with their children in, in, a, in a more productive way, they can visualise themselves being that person, being that mum, being that dad, and stepping into that role themselves and and just feeling what it feels like to be able to talk to your children in a way that they appreciate and and that you can communicate with them in the best possible way for the health the nurturing and the safety of that child yes absolutely and another lovely way of working with this is to draw what you want to be true so i sometimes do um, mandala workshops where I get people to think what they'd like to be true in their lives and then just using very simple childlike symbols actually drawing that within a circle or even just drawing on a sheet of paper so if you don't feel particularly close to say your teenage daughter or um, you want a better relationship with your younger son you could try uh, having a picture of, of the two you and your son holding hands walking along in the park or something um, or you could have a picture of a, a heart with yourself and your children and maybe your partner in the same uh, in the same heart getting on along together yeah people sitting around a table smiling at one another yeah um you know things along those lines so that's also quite effective with children as well to get them to draw things because sometimes they don't have the language and they're used to drawing creatively and it doesn't have to be factual. So if they want to draw themselves surrounded by the sun for confidence, then that's lovely. Um, if they want to draw themselves playing nicely with a friend, you know, that's great too. Um, yeah. Drawing, climbing up a tree. Perhaps they're afraid to climb up a tree. They could draw themselves balancing on a branch of a tree. You know, they, anything like that um, will, will help their minds to begin to be programmed towards um, those things they want to be true. So what about for the parents that have older children and they want to try and fix things, their relationship's not as good as it could be with their old children? Um, yeah. Is there anything that can be done to help parents in that situation? I think, obviously, it's useful if you've got 
a friend or a coach to reflect back what you're thinking and saying about that person. But I will quite often find that the parent feels quite rightly in some ways kind of got very frustrated and they expect the same behavior from the teenager. And, you know, they might even start saying, oh, there's no point in me doing that because she always walks away. Or, you know, there's no point in me suggesting we do this because he doesn't like that. Um, Or he always leaves his greens on the plate. So sometimes it's important to think about how people speak and think about the person with whom they're struggling. Because you are creating that reality as you're doing it. Absolutely. And not just that, they will only notice those times when that child or that person has that behavior. So yes, your daughter might lift her eyes or roll her eyes when you tell her to pull her skirt down to its proper length. <laughs> but, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you might imagine that when you say something else to her that she also raises her eyes because your mind is attuned to thinking this is going to happen. And there is, we have so much programming within our brain and our mind that will even almost create um, the experience that we expect to have rather than what is actually happening. Yeah. And, and somebody said to me some, some time, I can't remember what it was, who said it to me, but they made some reference to you might not always like your children, but you will always love them and you must always cherish that. Yes. Absolutely. And also to remember that our children are not their behavior. They're still lovable, whatever they do, and their behavior is born from something outside of them. Mm. Um, Whether it's behavior they've seen at school or on the telly or or, um, some sort of trigger they've got with you from the past, um, their behavior can change. Quite often, of course, it takes a parent to do the changing first and for their attitude and their energy to be different before the child can change. I had somebody come to me at a networking group the other day and she said, I'm really worried about my son. He he won't go and get help. And I said, maybe we need to work on your anxiety around him because at the moment it's possible that unintentionally you may not be allowing him to go and get help but even if he still won't you will feel more relaxed and better about the situation because we can't control someone else and then when he's ready he will go and get the help but you won't be suffering in between Hmm. Um, and you you do work with quite a lot of families don't you in the doors i do yeah um i i work with families a a lot of the time with them with the mum because she's often the one who is ready to make a change and understands that she has some control over a situation. Um, And it is really interesting, I I hear this a lot, that people quite often come to a coach or a healer or anyone with a symptom. And so often actually the symptom is not really the problem. Mm. The problem is something behind that. And yeah. it take, takes someone, it's lovely to have a friend um, to talk to and reflect back and support and listen. Uh, sometimes it takes a professional who's trained to hear what you're saying and what you're thinking and can help you get in touch with the emotions and the feelings that are going on in your body and help you to change those, um, release them and to replace them with something positive. And um, there, there is no shame whatsoever to say, okay, I think I need to get some professional help. You know, it could be you would only want one surgery, uh, one session or maybe two sessions. And that is a changing point in your life. That's, uh, yeah, that's right. Because, you know, sometimes it's just a simple thing like a fear over traveling or um, just a trigger. Um, I had one amazing lady, her daughter was playing up whenever they left the house she would have a tantrum. She had no idea why this little girl was having a tantrum. Um, at the same time as I had, I think I had two sessions with her altogether, this, this mum, 
but the first session I gave also gave her a book and some shells and she went home and she showed this little girl the book and read it with her gave her some attention but at the same time we we went back in time to this lady's childhood mm -hmm. and we discovered that her parents always had an argument just before they left the house ah, so we did some work on her and help to reassure her about how she as a child was feeling before they left the house she went home and the next time they went to leave the house her daughter instead of having a tantrum went and got her book and her shells and said here oh, mummy let's read this before we go oh how wonderful and i was i'm always completely surprised at the magic of what happens i've no idea what the results are going to be well, but why would you be so surprised because let me read <laughs> this out to the audience that you were actually voted as a finalist in the inspirational woman category in dorset yeah that's true yeah <laughs> so take some credit for how marvelous you are and for the wonderful work that you do with families because you, you are making a difference yeah thank you I think it's just because it's it's so surprising. Um, I help people to heal themselves. I help them to get in touch with their own inner wisdom. And I never know how that's going to pan out. So all I can do is trust that what I do is helping them in some way. And then it's up to them how that manifests in their, in their life. So it's just lovely and magical to hear their feedback. Um, it is, yeah, and, and yes, you're absolutely right. Trust yourself and just forget about the rest because yeah. you are facilitating change just by engaging in this conversation today. Yes, yeah. And um, every time you engage in conversation with someone, you are making a change. And we both are today. Parents, yeah. out, <laughs> parents out there will be listening and hearing just that bit that's right for them. Yeah, and I would urge them to get your book. I haven't got a copy because I haven't got any children anymore. Uh, but I have looked at your book, and I can see the great value in it and the work that you've put into it. By your own experience, you know that this works. Thank you. Yes, I I would be very grateful um, if we could get this book really spread out into the country, out into to any parents or schools or libraries where children could accidentally pick it up and, and learn the children who need it or the parents who need it you know the, would go to the right people if someone wants to get hold of your book how would they do that so i have the book on my website which um, is available throughout the world now it's been set up on the website vickytongman.com mm -hmm. and um the, the the postage and the currency is set up so it can go to any country i also have it on amazon uk yeah. so people like myself i quite like to be able to tap on amazon prime and know that the book is going to be there the next day so mm -hmm. i've got some copies on there as well again just search for daphne and the smiley shells it's a lovely it's name there. lovely name thank you and you know if you want to just drop me a line or if you're local give me a shout and I can bring a book to you um, or meet up at a cafe or at a networking group or somewhere you're going to be. And um, yeah, just, just let me know and I'll get a copy to you. So if there's a mum listening, they, they're saying to themselves, I really need Vicky to help me. I can recognise that some of the things that she's talked about are relevant to me. How would that mum or that dad get hold of you? Okay, so I'm on Facebook, so they can message me or go on my Facebook page, which is again Vicky Tongman. I'm on Instagram at Vicky Tongman. I'm on Twitter at Vicky, at Vicky Tongman Coach. Um, so any of those um, uh, ways of contacting me would be great. I've got a um, phone number and email address on my uh, website. Um, the I won't try and read those out now because no, no. Well, I, I will yeah. put them on the links yeah. for the radio show, and I will put them on the links for YouTube when I post it on YouTube um, after today's live uh, audio on the yeah. speaker platform. So okay. don't worry about that. Um, 
before we go, I wondered if you could just sum up briefly um, the best way someone could start to take steps today to better communicate with their child. If you've got one tip, what would that mm -hmm. be? Okay, if we're talking about a young child, one of the lovely tips I read recently is rather than standing over them and expecting them to notice them, come down to their level. So if they're playing and you want them to get up and come to tea or something, don't just shout across the room. Go and sit with them, ask them what they're doing, have a little chat with them and then say, you know, get up and say, right, we're, we're getting up for tea now. Can you, can you come, come along with me or something like that? So get their attention at their level. We often feel ignored as parents and they're not ignoring us. They are literally tuned out. They're not hearing us. So and, we and need to get eye contact with them. And what about if it's a teenager? I'm not an expert on teenagers, but ah, okay. one, one <laughs> of the things I noticed with my own was if I wanted something done, I found it much better if I, if I gave them a timeline rather than expecting them to drop something that minute, I would say, I'd really like the hall cleared so I can hoover in the next half hour, please. Okay. So I'm respecting their time and I'm respecting that they're doing something that they're interested in. I'm not saying I'm more important than you, yes. but what I am doing is I'm explaining I'm not just asking you to clear the hall for the sake of it, but I want to be able to clean the hallway and your bags and shoes are in the way. Please, could you take them up to your room within the next half hour when you finish what you're doing sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, and it That's gives them good. a time to either finish or to take a break, to choose to take a break somewhere within there. You uh, see, so you are an expert away. when it comes to teenagers as well. <laughs> I must admit, I was very blessed with my with my sons, so um, yeah, I didn't have uh, too many issues with them. But um, yeah, and I suppose the last one for older children is help them in some way to find out a goal in their life, even if they're not going to become a fireman or a boxer or a, a nurse or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter as long as they've got some kind of goal, which gives them motivation to do what they need to at school, etc. You know, school is one of those places where you tend to get told you've got to do this, that and the other, and there's no reason why, just because the teacher tells you so. So if they can find a reason for working towards getting some results um, in their academic work, uh, then even if they choose to, to change their career as they get older, or one day they want to be a ballet dancer and the next say they want to drive a, an ambulance it doesn't matter at least they're visualizing a future and having a reason to mm. do all this all this work that there is demanded of them from school yes i, I saw some very interesting uh, articles this week about homeschooling children how that is um on the increase now and there must be different dynamics with homeschooled children because they're spending more time with their parents ah. so then it's really this becomes even more important to know that as the parent you are their mentor you are their coach you are their parent yeah and the time that you spend with them still needs to be that quality time yeah yeah uh, I would have loved to have homeschooled my children. Now, I, now looking back, I would have loved to have done that, um, but I didn't. And I am most grateful that I've got three healthy sons. And I put my hands up and say, I might not have been the best parent, but I did the best that I could. And I'm proud to say that. Yeah. You know, no That's matter it. if you've not done the perfect job, it still doesn't mean you shouldn't feel proud when you've done the best you can. Yeah, and that's something for ch children, older children, to remember as well. That it's a phrase in NLP too that everyone does the best they can with the resources that they have. And exactly. if if a parent hasn't done what a child would like have liked at the time, well, it's they didn't know any different. That's all. 
Mm-hmm. That's all. It's, it's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. I can't make up for everything that I did wrong right now. Mm. Uh, I can only be the best person I can right now. And I cannot be responsible for what people think about me either. And that's, yeah. that's just it. There's nothing more we can do about that. The past is past. We mustn't dwell on that. We're now here in the present, doing the best that we can, living the best life that we can, being as happy as we can right now. Yeah. So do you have any parting wisdom, like a favorite quote that you'd like to share? Oh, okay. So, yeah, my favorite quote, I believe, was said by Disraeli originally. But it was the best gift that you can give to another is to show to them their own. Mm. So by showing your child or someone around you what gifts they have, you're giving them greater resources than just gifting them something that you have to give. Ah, that's, that's interesting. Because uh, I think a lot of parents feel obliged these days to have to buy expensive great gifts at Christmas time and put themselves in debt which in itself causes more issues doesn't it? Yes and with my background in uh, banking and credit unions and things yes I'm I'm very aware of that and yeah the best we can do is teach children or help children to find their own skills and qualities because they're going to need to know those in the future. Mm -hmm. They won't necessarily be in the same job all their life like people expected to be. So they need to know what their skills are that they can take to any industry um, or any role. Uh, It doesn't have to be the same role in each job as they move on. They just have to know who they are and and what they have to offer. As much as my sons used to moan about me teaching them to cook and clean and do the dishwasher. I, I think we came to an agreement recently that actually if I hadn't have taught them to be that resourceful, um, my son wouldn't have been a chef. My other son wouldn't have been so house proud. And <laughs> I've taught my, my sons to be strong and resilient. And some people think it might have been, you know, cruel. Their friends used to make comments, well, uh, she's not going to let you out till you've done the vacuum in. And they're absolutely right. But that taught them responsibility and I'm not taking any of that back I still believe that I did the best I could for my children (laughs) that's my defense and I'm sticking to it (laughs) and we all should feel that way you know we want to do the best we bring children into the world to care and nurture them to keep them safe and if we've succeeded in that we've done a really really good job okay So thank you so much for the show today. And I think you've done a really good job today in getting all your points over. And I would highly recommend buying Daphne and the Smiley Shells and to work with your child to give them better outcomes in life. Because this is is what we're here for as parents and mentors. We, We want to give them the best. Thank you so much for inviting me along. And uh, I really enjoyed our conversation and I do trust that it will reach the right people who will learn what they, what they would like to from this conversation. At the right time. At the right time. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.